So, All right, good to see everyone. So today's lecture, I'm going to just start going through the course outline and then we're going to jump into the first lecture. Um, there is a little bit of an experiment here, which I'm going to get into in a second when I go through the outline. But as you can see, I've currently got a Teams window open. I uh, previously, this course has been taught for the last, well, two years with me and then one year before that online. And I see no particularly good reason to deviate from that, especially if it helps everyone plan their lives and It'd be a little bit more flexible, especially in honors and masters level. I think you guys can handle that. Uh, but this isn't the nicest venue I've ever been in in my life. So we don't have a, like an Ethernet cable or anything like that. So results may vary. That's why I said to your class rep last night that I think everyone should try coming in today at least, just in case something like completely doesn't work. But it seems to be fine. So we'll see how it's going. Um, but one thing to notice is whatever you know noises we make in the lecture, it's not going to be recorded and picked up here. And I'm also listening to my laptop for anyone asking questions online. So I hope that that's going to work out okay. Um, also, like the podium is in a kind of weird position relative to the, to the screen, so I want to stand to the side. But uh, we'll we'll see. But we do need a little bit of silence just to maybe work properly, I guess. And if you're going to ask a question, you might just have to also speak up so that this can this can pick pick you up. Um, depending on how the recording for today goes, I might go buy a microphone for next week. All right, so as you can see in the outline, outline my name is Devin. Uh, I'm a lecturer, and then Alex will be your, your tutor. Alex took this course two years ago. He was head tutor for it last year. He is very, very slick at this material by now, and so I recommend you, you kind of lean on him fairly heavily. Um, my consultations there, my physical consultations are on a Monday from 1 until 3, and Tuesday from 10 until 12, except for next Tuesday, unfortunately. Um, and it's in MSB UG11, uh, so you guys can come see me in person then. But in general, I try to have like an open door policy, unless I'm busy doing my own research or something. Like if the door's open, you're welcome to come knock, so I talk about the course or whatever. Um, this course has a description. Uh, I'll leave it for you guys to, to read. The course outline has a description. I gave something like this um, at the honors induction lecture, if any of you were, were there. I, quite a few of you um and so the guy my goal for this course is to go through a lot of the familiar mathematics that you guys have already covered but go through it with more of a geometric perspective try and tie concepts together try and maybe just close the loop on a lot of these things so that you end up coming away feeling like you actually understand and can uh, interpret the mathematics that you're using right if you do principal components analysis on data when you go into a company and that's the the first tool you always use on data you need to understand what an eigenvector is to know what you're doing when you project, project onto the eigenbasis. And those are things we're going to cover now in the first couple of weeks. Um, but it is going to be far more, I hope, interpretable and an intuitive take on, on maths. I have no doubt that a lot of you guys can do the maths, but what I care about more is the insights and the understanding in it. And in a lot of the, the ways that I test and things like that, that's also what I'm looking for. Not just can we like follow an algorithm, it's can we uh, you know, understand or, or show if find the easiest way to do something or show that we actually know what's going on in the background. Uh, secondly, there's a Discord server. I saw some of you jumping in already this morning. Um, I liked the Discord server. Again, this course ran online, so that was the main way I communicated in the past. Uh, I would like to keep things more face-to-face -face just because that makes it easier for me. But uh, there is a ticket system on Discord. It should, I think, hopefully be familiar. If not, it's fairly self-explanatory. I can help anyone who's having teething issues with that as well. But uh, the way the ticket system works is you, it just opens a new channel every time you press a button and it's got just you, me and the tutors in it. And then we can discuss whatever issues you want uh, and you know whatever topics you want. Some students like to open one ticket and keep it for a while. Others like to kind of open one, close it for each topic. You guys can do whatever you like. Um, if things are getting bloated, I might just message you and say, can I close your ticket if we haven't spoken for a while? But that's about it. Everything else is up to you guys. I will do my best to just be generally available on Discord. Um, again, it's, you know, I, I have obviously my own things that I need to do. But if you message me at like a reasonable time or if we have a test the next day or something like that and you guys are all working, I will do my best to be working as well for you. And 
ready, ready to kind of respond to tickets and, and questions on Discord. What I also strongly encourage is that you guys chat to each other on the Discord. In the past, that's actually been some of the most uh, helpful ways of going about things. There's a general channel, there's you know a couple of these things. There's also a suggestions channel on the Discord. If, and maybe that's kind of where your um, class rep comes into it. If you guys feel like I'm doing something wrong, if something needs to be better, if something's not good with the venue, whatever you have for me, put it there. We can chat about it. The, more, more often than not, there's nothing I can do. I'm kind of doing my best as it is. But uh, if you have suggestions, feel free to speak up. I'm happy to, again, and honors and masters level, we're kind of working together to make sure that this is a success. So I'm happy to be open to ideas. Um, and then, yeah, in the general channel and things like that, like speak to each other. If you have an issue with the tutorial or like a question, just ask generally. Um, none of the tutorials are full marks. Uh, in a past version of the course, they were, but then I found that everyone just, either they worked alone or they copied each other and neither was good because then everyone was either struggling or a whole bunch of people got caught for plagiarism. And I don't want to set anyone up for that sort of failure. So tutorials are just there for your own learning. What you will realize very quickly is I test heavily from the tutorials. I don't copy questions, um, but they will look familiar if you do your tutorials when you get to a test. So things should be pretty easy if you've gone through that pretty consistently. So here's a summary of the hours. We went through my consultation hours, online consultations on the Discord. You know, feel free anytime, any day. Uh, the ticket system, that just means that I won't lose track of you. So I can also answer when I'm ready. And then obviously, slightly unfortunately, our lecture is on a Friday afternoon in quite a stuffy venue. So not ideal. I understand this. I will try my best to not drag on. But you know, it is just what it is. This is a fairly dense course. Uh, and so there might be days when we do just go to five and we're just going to have to maybe deal with that. Um, as it says there, I think it says here or it says somewhere else, but I may as well talk about it now. Um, so it, it's on Teams. The, one of the reasons it's on Teams is just because then I can show my, my screen, but also um, I can then record the lectures. And so the lecture recordings will be placed on YouTube, maybe not the same day. But usually within a couple of days of the lecture, it goes up on YouTube. You guys can watch it, review it. If you have to miss a lecture for whatever reasons, you don't have to then. If you have to miss a lecture, you then. I'm not actually sure if this is still showing up. Yeah. If you have to miss a lecture, then you can catch up on the YouTube. All right, next thing, while this tries to find uh, versus Wi-Fi, um, there is a course textbook, and we're going to be following it pretty carefully. Um, the, what I will say is the textbook is relatively more dense than the course content requires. So if you're going to sit down and read the textbook front to back, there's going to be a lot there that is just slow and kind of difficult for you to get into. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend going that route, what I would say is try follow, obviously, the lectures, the slides, I'll put them up beforehand on Moodle. Um, use those as your main means of studying. And then the textbook is more there for if you want to go a little bit deeper into something, if you're really struggling with the concept, and we consulted, and the way I'm explaining something isn't working for you, and I've tried once or twice, maybe then jump into the textbook and see if, if like a little bit more of a formal, rigorous treatment of it, it works for you. Uh, it is this Days of textbook at the bottom here. Um, it's free as well, so you shouldn't have any issues getting that. So I'm just going to pull the outline quickly from Moodle. Should be a. No, that's not it. OK, 
Okay, so maybe the online version of this just isn't going to work. And we're going to have to just be only in person. All right, this is going to take two minutes. Sorry, everyone. Okay, where were we? Okay, then as far as the course resources are concerned, uh, I don't mind what you use. If you find anything better on YouTube and stuff, that's fine. Use it as much as you like. Um, in general, just you're welcome to manage your own way through the course. I appreciate that I explain things in one way. Mathematics is about thinking about things in different ways. More often than not, there is one way that will work for you and it might not be the way I've decided to explain things. And so if someone does it better, like MIT Open Courseware or something, by all means, use that. Uh, what I will say is just be careful then that you're not going to do something that is kind of wildly different from the way we do things and then we can't mark your test or something like that. Uh, if there is a different method to do something and you're aware that it's very different to the way I teach it, just check with me first. At the very least, I'll just add it to my memo. Uh, for the markers because I don't always mark everything just myself. So that's the one risk, but uh, I haven't had issues with that in the past. Most people just do things the way that it's it's taught. Uh, then you can look at the course objectives. So firstly, we're going to go into linear algebra and the way this also works, the rhythm of the course that we usually have one week that is relatively more definitions heavy, slightly more technical. And then the second week is where we like tie things together. We look at an example. I try to bring in more of the intuition, but uh, the first week is usually just more of a take things as they come and trust that like I'll close the loop on things later and do some examples. So for example, today we're going to go into the definition of a group. It's going to seem very vague and weird. And so, but next week when I chat a little bit more about it and how it ties into vector space and things like that, it'll become a little bit more clearer why we bring up groups in a data science course. Uh, you guys can go scroll through all of this. Uh, if you are basing this off of anyone or know anyone from last year, you'll know that there was probability theory in this course previously. Uh, we've moved that out of this course into call it. Um, I might still bring in a little bit just because there is interesting ways that like calculus informs probability theory and stuff like that. But I think there's more than enough courses that go into Bayesian statistics there in your honors course. And I'm pretty sure everyone here will do it in some course. So I don't think we have to do it here. I would much rather go deeper into continuous optimization and the um, um, automatic differentiation, which is unique to this course and things like that. And then lastly, if there's time permitting and if anyone's interested, we can chat a little bit about how a lot of the stuff that we go through in this course is used in like modern research because kind of believe it or not, the singular value decomposition, for example, is still the most effective way to like theoretically understand neural networks. In all of like the major theory at the moment, it's usually something like a singular value decomposition or neural tangent kernel is a Taylor expansion. Uh, mean field theory is just integration and central limit theorem. So we can chat a little bit more about that, but that's time permitting. It's not testable. You don't have to worry about it. It's more just like nice to have, I guess. Uh, the stuff that you guys are probably then more curious about, grading. Uh, we're going to have two tests. The dates and are already up. Unfortunately, I couldn't give you guys a choice in that because they needed to book the venue at the start of the semester, so like last week. Uh, so I picked the latest possible date, which is usually what everyone goes for anyway. Um, but it is, so unfortunately, then is also uh, the, last, the, uh, the last lecture of the week. So it'll be during the lecture time on a Friday afternoon which isn't great. And again, I just, I apologize if that's what we were given. Um, the way it works is that your tests will be two hours. 
and each hour of assessment, be it test or exams, is 10% of the course. So your two hour tests count 20%. You'll have two exams each three hours counting 30%. It sounds like a lot. And I know that having two exams is difficult, but what we do is we split the, the content in half. One exam is usually in the first week. One exam is in the last week. You have a lot of time to kind of go through each of them. The first exam will be just linear algebra. So the first blocks content. The second exam will be on calculus optimization and that sort of thing. Uh, also, they're three hours, but most people don't use all three hours in the exams. But again, if you're the kind of person who wants to, like, don't, you know, use that as a benchmark or anything. Uh, tutorials. At the end of every chapter, there will be a, a tutorial that I've put up. There's five of them. Again, this is the best way to prepare for tests and exams. I encourage you to use them very, very, like, strictly, rigorously, whatever, go through them. Talk, talk about the problems with each other. Some of them are difficult. If they seem like way out of your league, there is usually a good lesson in them. So a lot of the proofs and stuff that come up in your tutorials, they are proofs that I've chosen because there's a step in the proof that I think is insightful. I don't, uh, this isn't a proving class, even though you might still have to do some, um, but the, the like kind of proof techniques and stuff isn't what I'm interested in. There's no like induction or anything like that. It's usually like, do you understand that the singular value decomposition has a very particular structure? Can you use that at a step in the proof? And everything else around the proof, once you've not seen that kind of insightful trick, then it's pretty easy. Um, so I think that's usually, if you see a, a proof and you're struggling with it, that's usually why. And that's a good opportunity to chat with me, your tutors, or each other. But uh, you guys will kind of figure out your own way of working. There are the test dates and the content. And then lastly, you know, academic integrity, you guys can read that. Um, I hope you don't have to go too much into that. scary thing but we do have to just kind of work at it all right um looks like we have wi-fi again on my tablet so i'm going to try um i'm going to try use that again uh suggestions open if you think this hybrid thing sucks please tell me i will stop it um it is currently feeling pretty janky for me i don't know about you guys but i'm feeling pretty uncomfortable with it but maybe it'll be helpful i don't know Cool. <laughs> we have an answer. There we go. I'm also glad to, to know that you've been hearing me the whole time.
This is Yanda. I don't think I was sharing the course outline there now that I think about it. So hopefully you're following along. It is on Moodle, but uh, sorry about that. Okay. All right. If no one has anything else to bring up quickly um, before we start, then we can get going on linear algebra part one. All good? Cool. Okay, so mathematics is the foundations of machine learning and data science. That's why you guys are here. There is a cool picture in the textbook of this. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, that's somewhat obvious. And what is kind of cool though is that we will start to come to try and tie some of these ideas back to the algorithms they get in, they uh, influence. So for example, like logistic regression can pretty much fall out of a an understanding of a little bit of probability theory, so I might just show you that still as well. But you can essentially derive logistic regression mathematically, and it ends up being, I find, a bit more intuitive. Um, so we might come to things like that. Um, and so the ones we will be covering is linear algebra, algebraic geometry, matrix decomposition, uh, probability and distributions is not there anymore. Okay, that needs to come out and then continuous optimization. Uh, but large components of each of the above areas are vital machine learning and data science, virtually all existing approaches use multiple areas. Um, and then this is just a slide that was put in here to justify the fact that we need to understand how to use the tools or what the tools are doing underneath the hood rather than just throw them at a problem. So I know that a lot of people by now would have seen like SK Learn and stuff, you can do regressions and that, but uh, you maybe don't understand the mathematics behind it fully or you know whatever hopefully by the end of this course you will come to that and so the roadmap to start linear algebra is this we're going to start today by looking mainly at this piece here so you're going to start off by looking at like vectors and matrices and those sorts of things and going to linear systems of linear equations again that is and gas linear nation will come up probably next week uh again that's probably old hat for most of you, uh, simultaneous equations are taught in high school. So it's not going to feel groundbreaking until we start tying it back to like ideas of bases and things like that. And that'll come up next week. So for today, I'll ask you guys to just kind of, you know, bear with me, let's get through the definitions, try start off with solid basics again. So let's look at what a vector is. So the most familiar way that most of us understand vectors is geometrically. So down here at the bottom, you can kind of draw an arrow in some kind of 2D or 3D space. But there are different ways of also thinking about vectors. Another way is that you can describe a set of polynomials as a vector. And the reason for that is because the way you will define a polynomial is, let's say, y is equal to a... Oh, everything's going to fall into that. You'll define a polynomial as ax plus, uh, let's say, bx squared plus cx cubed or whatever and so on. And so what ends up becoming the vector in that case will be a, b, c. And you've now defined a polynomial with that vector. You can do a whole bunch of you can do a whole bunch of um, kind of arithmetic then in function space and on these polynomial functions and in more advanced areas of mathematics that actually becomes pretty useful. And the whole point then of defining a vector space and what we'll come to at the end of this lecture today is that once you've shown that something is a vector space, you can inherit a whole bunch of properties from it. You don't actually have to think too hard about any of the mathematics after that. And that's kind of the power of it and also maybe the the more computer science way of looking at it is that you make one problem look like another problem. And if you know how to solve for the second problem, you by inherently know how to solve the first. And that's the whole thing. So if I can understand how to interpret arrows in 2D space, I know then how to interpret and work with polynomials of order two. And that's essentially the whole kind of idea of why we define vectors like this. Also, let me change the color red because I see we don't have a red bulb in the thing. Um, what do we have? Yeah, that'll do. All right. So that's a vector. 
and it is nothing more than just a collection of n numbers. So if you have an n-dimensional vector that is just n scalar values connected together in the same way that I showed you A, B, C there before. And so let's consider now the, the following little problem. We're not going to solve it yet. We're just going to use this to motivate where we're going. So you are a factory that produces n different products. So n capital N1 to capital N, small n. And you have m different raw materials represented by capital R. And you know that you have a particular budget of BI of each of these raw materials, right? And you want to now produce, you want to figure out how much to produce of each product such that you use all of your raw materials. It's a pretty simple um, kind of problem, essentially just budgeting. Uh, but how do you represent it mathematically, again, in a way that allows us to inherit all of what we know about vector calculus and things like that, all the arbitrary theory? and solve some interesting problems and make it interpretable. Okay, so the question is how much many of each product should you make to ideally use all your raw materials? So you can write this as a system of equations. Okay, so again, I remind you, B is how much we have available. Uh, the A's, which they switched here. The A's in this case will then be how much of each resource is used in making each product, and then the X's is how much of each product we make, all right? So if I wanna make uh, product X1, I'm gonna use A11 amount of this first resource, and so we just wanna balance, uh, balance all these equations, okay? So can we find the tuple X that solves this? So the tuple X is the one that, you know, will get us closer to, as close as possible to using all of our resources. Uh, another question you might ask is, is there a unique, a unique solution or multiple? And uh, you can look at what I wrote here. So it says a space of solutions could exist in, when solving this problem. Uh, so one, yeah, that's not showing up clearly. So it says a space of solutions could exist. So for example, if I could buy steel and make uh, metal desk legs, or you could just buy desk legs directly, that's the kind of thing that would come up in this problem where there's a space of solutions. I have multiple strategies to optimize the problem in a little kind of toy example of producing something. And then if not, how, if there is no solutions, so there's no way that I can produce a set quantity of each product that I manufacture such that I use all of my resources. How close can I get uh, to actually using all my resources is what is the best that I can do is another question you might answer. So in principle, we can uh, try directly answer at least the first two questions using using simple algebra. Okay, so we can, well, that catches up. We can answer the first two using simple algebra. However, the matrix appro approach is easier and more scalable, particularly, particularly when we want to automate and do a whole bunch of these kind of problems. You don't want to go through the high school method of solving systems of linear equations. Okay, and so the way we would then write this in a matrix form is to formalize the system as above. So you have a matrix multiplication. So capital A is a matrix here. X is how much of each product we're manufacturing. We've just packed that into a vector. And then B again is our available budget of resources. Okay, so the question here is, um, again, how do we choose X such that the system of equations on the left equals the B? But what's great is that we can now answer this just by manipulating a large matrix A, all right? And it's, at the end of the day, that is still, what we've done is we've packed the kind of uh, equations we had earlier, but we've done in a way now where we know that, that there are matrix operations that work, and we'll kind of show you this, the three set ones in a, in a little bit, okay? And just to then revise matrix multiplication, so just, you know, again, we're starting this from the ground up, uh, this is how it works. So on the left here is the, the A matrix, but written with all the different kind of coefficients that we had earlier. So A1 through A1 to N. All right, so these are all the resources you need, or this is how much of the first resource, resource you will use when producing this set of X items. The other way to read this is that this is how many of each resource I need to produce one item, all right, this first product here. Okay, so that depending on whether or not you're looking at the matrix row-wise or column-wise, the interpretation is slightly different, okay? 
And I always like this. So I mean, this definition should be really familiar to most of you if it's not slowing me down now. But uh, I always also like to point out that you can think of matrix multiplication in this form as a bot at the bottom here. So you can think of a matrix as a vector of vectors, okay? In which case I've now drawn a one with like two lines above it, just to indicate that that's a column vector. This is a column vector. This is a column vector. So again, a one now is how much of each, each resource I need to produce um, object one or product one. And if you think about it this way, then this is just vector times a vector, which is even easier. This is then the dot product. And so you know that the way you do the dot product is you just take index one, multiply it by the index one over there, take index two, multiply it by index two over there, index three, multiply it by index three, and then you just sum those terms together. Okay, standard dot product formula. Again, I'm, I don't wanna to go too slowly, but if anyone isn't certain of that, do let me know now. Um, and so, the important thing to note here is that what it then becomes over here is a summation of these column vectors, okay? So when you're doing a matrix times by a vector, the output is a summation of column vectors. And so that's gonna be really important when we come to like bases, bases and change of bases and things like that, when you understand that this, there's a particular structure to this kind of product. So I know this is probably really boring or kind of, I'm going slowly through this, but that structure is something to just keep in mind as we go forward. All right. Any questions before I carry on? No? Oh yeah. Um, in this example, you set up this like column vectors, right? And you were saying that it's basically like column one by row one. Isn't it, should it not be, um, Row vectors and then it should be a row by a column. And then essentially, because this could be like a three by any three matrix, so the other side is a three by one. So for it to be computable, it should be a three, a something by three and three by one, if I'm wrong. No, no, you're, okay, yeah, you're correct. We're going to come to that now about the rules of uh, matrix multiplication. At this point, I'm assuming the rank is uh, correct. You know what I mean? We're not, we're not mis multiplying them. What I was more going for here was the interpretation of the columns. Um, but as you point out, there is also another interpretation of it being rows. Um, my, the main thing here that I just want also, the main takeaway of this is that how you take that information from the problem we set up and pack it into a matrix. Okay. And so because we know that X1 through N is how much of each product we're making, when we do this kind of structure with the matrix multiplication like that, we know that when we read a row across, it's how much of resource one am I using to produce output or product X1? When it's A1N, it's how much of uh, this resource am I using to produce the end product, okay? So for example, this would be like, um, what's the interpretation here? So it's, let's say steel, wood, and those sorts of things will be on the columns, not on the rows. So this will then, let me make sure I'm doing this right. Yeah, okay, so every row here will be like wood. So for example, it's like, I'm using this much wood to produce X product X1, and I'm using this much wood to produce product Xn, okay? And then if I read down the columns, it's I need wood and steel and, I don't know, nails or whatever to produce that product up top there, right? So that's the interpretation of how you pack these things together. And as you can see, even for me, it's unintuitive to try and like kind of map it on directly, but that's what you're going to have to do in like a test is kind of sit down and think that based on the way that I'm doing the matrix multiplication, I know that I am making X1 of product one. So then if I do A11 times product one, then that's obviously then how much of that resource I'm using in product one. All right. So I know it's a long-winded way to answer your question, but that's uh, that's the kind of intu intuition or interpretation that you're going to need to kind of set the problem up when you start. Cool. All right. So then, matrix operations are again pretty familiar. 
but the first one is addition. So if I have a matrix A and a matrix B, and I just add them together, then all you're actually doing is just taking them element-wise and adding the elements, and that gives you a matrix that is the same shape as the original two matrices. So you can only add matrices that have the same shape, all right? So in this case, this is M rows uh, and N columns, all right? So the A goes down to M here, and then B goes up to N there. Okay, and then that gives you a matrix of the same shape out again. Matrix multiplication is the more tricky one, and then as you pointed out, there is a rule to it. So we can take a matrix A, which has M rows and columns, and multiply it with a matrix B that has N rows K columns. And that will then give us a matrix, which is M by K. All right? So the rule here is that the number of columns in the matrix on the left must match the number of rows in the matrix on the right. And then what that gives you is a new matrix with the same number of rows as A and same number of columns as B. All right? So the shapes are M by N times by N by K. The Ns essentially fall away, and that will give you M by K. All right? That's a useful trick. Uh, again, I'm sure you all know it. But uh, that's, especially when we come to um, calculus, that's useful to remember because there we're going to have to be, uh, the way you do the derivatives of matrices is to kind of unpack that. So um, you'll be doing like the opposite of that. So it's important to remember it and don't get kind of caught up and trying to like multiply matrices the wrong way around. It's a really easy mistake to make. All right. And so as I said here, this is an important formula, particularly for the calculus chapter. Okay, but what it essentially is, is just, uh, yeah, the rows of A dot product with the columns of B and the new packets together. <coughs> okay, so this is larger what we just said, but it's important to note that these matrix, matrix multiplication is not what is known as commutative. So commutativity is when if I have some um, kind of object called an A and another one B, Matrix multiplication is defined for A times B, at least in this example, because the inner dimensions fit, right? So we have K columns of A, K rows of B. However, we cannot do it the other way. We can't go B times A, right? Because then the shapes we have are K by M times by uh, K by M times by M by K. All right, these two shapes don't fit. And so the matrix multiplication is just not defined. There's actually just nothing you can do here for it. So you can't change the order of the matrix multiplication. So whenever you do matrix multiplication, make sure that what you are doing is going in the right order. And this is important as well when you get to Gaussian elimination. Because if you do Gaussian elimination the wrong way around, there's a way where it will look correct and you'll never know you're wrong until, I mean, until you just get your test back or whatever. So when we get there, I'll point it out. But it corresponds to doing something very, it corresponds to using a different identity first. And I imagine that it's something that's caught up. Everyone who's taken a linear algebra course, I don't know why they don't say it more explicitly. I will try at least try to show you why it happens. But um, yeah, anyway, just make sure that you're doing these things in the correct kind of shape and order when you're dealing with matrices. Um, it is associative and distributive, but I'll leave that for now because we're going to come to those definitions in like an hour. Okay, um, and then one of the most important versions of matrix multiplication uh, is when we have number one, two square matrices. So square means that it has the same number of rows as columns, two square matrices, A and B. And when we multiply them together, they give us what is known as the identity matrix. The identity matrix is a matrix with only ones on its diagonal. So one, one, one and zeros on all of the off diagonals, so everywhere else. Uh, and so what this essentially is the same as is like one, having just one as a scalar. This is the matrix version of that. What is interesting is that if B, let's say, is the inverse of A, so if I multiply A on the right by B, I'll get the identity, then we know that A is also the inverse of B, and so I can multiply A or B on the right by A, and I'll also get the identity. So this, in general, as I just showed you on the previous slide, commutativity is not true of matrices unless they're the inverse of each other. Then it's true. 
that, and then we can note that as you would expect with the uh, minus one in the top left, uh, top right. Um, and then as we alluded to in that first kind of example, not every matrix has an inverse. Um, if it did, then we, in that kind of production example, then there would never be like a space of infinite solutions. There would never be something like being able to buy steel and make chair legs versus just buy chair legs from another manufacturer. Those kind of equivalences is what makes a matrix uninvertible when we set up these systems. All right. And then there's a little bit of terminology. So if an inverse exists, we call A either regular. I don't really use that terminology, but it's, a, it's there. So A is either regular, it's invertible, or it's non-singular. I think non-singular, uh, invertible is obvious, but non-singular is the one that's most interesting and, and kind of important to I guess it's three o'clock. You guys want to take a 15 minute break quickly and then we'll, uh, while well, I try to get this sorted. Uh, Ziando, are you there?
Uh, okay, I can't really hear you too well, but I'm going to ask you just to confirm if you can see my screen quickly. I think I'm just going to try and switch only to the laptop. Uh, Ziana, can you put in the chat whether or not you can? Oh, I see you've done that. Uh, uh, can you put in this uh, chat whether or not you can see the slides? Oh, okay, I see your message. Thank you, Zianda.
Uh, Zyanda, can you hear me and see the screen? Great, thank you. All right, you guys wanna, let's get going again. 
Um, so during the break, just this question came up again about what the interpretation is of this, and I thought I'd go through it once more, uh, just because I think while we're chatting, uh, I came to an interesting terminology that might help. So the way you can think of the columns in this example of um, like production is that each column is a recipe for a product. So for example, it's like quantity of eggs, quantity of flour, you know, quantity of water, whatever, in making a cake. So x1 is cake. That's the recipe, that vector. So when I multiply it by x1, it tells you how many cakes am I making? What is its recipe? And then that adds up to the totally, total resources that I've used. I don't know if that's a helpful perspective on it, but that is then kind of one way to look at it. It's just each column is like, yeah, the, the recipe for one unit of X1. And then X1 uh, of, yeah, whatever product X1 is referencing. And X1 is how many of that product am I making? Again, we'll come to an example probably, I think, early next, yeah, first thing we'll do next week is an actual example tying all of this together and it'll be a little bit make more sense. But today we still got to get through our definitions and where we left off was the last definition is that A is regular, invertible or non-singular. So this means that it's inverse does exist. Again, please just take note of the non-singular terminology. It um, kind of won't seem particularly intuitive now. And it, you know, even, even when I get to why I want you to remember it, it's probably not super intuitive, but uh, it is kind of a, one of the more important ways of referencing this. And then if the inverse does not exist, then it is singular or non-invertible. All right, so invertibility and singularity are opposite things in this case. Okay, that's terminology. A little bit more uh, just definitions of operations we can do on matrices. So up to now, we've covered uh, addition, multiplication, the special case of multiplication where you have an inverse, and that gives you the identity matrix when you multiply an inverse with it, its matrix. Uh, now what we have is transpose. So if A is an M by N matri matrix, then B is the matrix with N rows and M columns. So the number of rows and columns swip, swap, swaps. And then the, the actual values themselves also swap. So for example, everything on, the, on a diagonal stays the same. So 1, 6, 11 still says 1, 6, 11. However, now the number five was in the second row, first column. So now it will be in the second column, first row, right? So you can see the I's and J's over here have switched. So what it means is that the rows and column indices have now switched. Uh, again, thinking about them in terms of indices is sometimes a little bit trickier. Um, and so you can just remember that it's kind of more one of the more intuitive operations where you almost just mirror the, um, yeah, mirror the matrix and then whatever was kind of in the top right here comes to the bottom left and so on. Um, if you're in a case where A and A transposed are equal, it is what is known as a symmetric matrix. So what that would mean is if it was kind of one, two, two, one down here, if I then did this operation, I would still end up with a matrix that was one, two, two, one uh, in those respective indices. And so um, we don't have any issues. They're equal and so they're called symmetric. Yes. Uh, the singular values of the matrix. Uh, we we'll get to that in week five and six. So that's singular value decomposition. The singular values is how much stretch a matrix is doing when you multiply with it. Um, and when you have a singular matrix, what it means is that you don't have enough singular values to stretch in all directions. And so you're collapsing one of the spaces. So for example, if I had a 3D cube and I squash it down into a square, I have stretched now to a point where I have lost information on how to come back out. All right, so I can't now expand a square into a cube. It's more intuitive once we've gone through the full matrix decomposition, but that's what it's referencing. This idea of I have stretched something to zero. I have collapsed a dimension. All right, for now, we've got the transpose and a whole bunch of identities um, that we can go through. Uh, we went through the inverse one over here. So earlier it was A and B, but now obviously we know that B is actually K written as A inverse. And we know that in that case, the matrices commute, but they don't always. And that's, again, if there's one thing we take away from what I've said right now, matrices do not commute. Uh, the inverse of A times B, so going A, B first, then inverting, 
is the same as inverting B, inverting A, reversing their order, and then doing the multiplication. And one thing just remember is when we're doing these invertibility things, the matrix has to be square. All right. So in this case, this is a, an n by n times an n by n. This is still an n by n times an n by n. All right. So that's we're not running into issues swapping the, the order there. Um, adding and then inverting is not the same as inverting first and adding. So that's a little bit different with the matrix multiplication. If I transpose twice, I get back to the original matrix. So you can think of that in terms of the, these indices up here. So the first time I transpose, I and J swap. The second time I transpose, I and J swap, which gets me back to this ordering cap. So it just cycles around like that. That's that identity. The adding and then transposing, you can transpose then add. You can multiply or transpose or transpose individually and then multiply, but reversing the order. And then lastly, you can invert and transpose in either order. And there's a notation for it that I don't really use but uh, you can kind of do them in alternating orders. The one that here that I've used the most is this one. That is actually a really useful identity because it kind of helps you sometimes change the way that you do things uh, and kind of can make computation more efficient and that sort of thing. Uh, it's also, again, singular value decomposition. It kind of comes up a little bit there. So that one I'd say, if you want to memorize identities, which is not kind of always recommended in math, this is a good one to just try and hang on to uh, and I suppose there is an easy, similar version with the inverse. Cool. Then we have matrix multiplication with scalars. So if I have some real value lambda and an M by N matrix, so again, arbitrary number of rows and columns, if I'm multiplying on the left by a scalar, that's the same as multiplying each of the individual elements of the matrix by that same scalar. And it's the same as multiplying on the right by the scalar. So again, what you will notice is this, these two on the end is known as commutativity. So scalar multiplication with a matrix is commutative. Matrix multiplication with a matrix is not. Okay, um, if I have two scalars, then I can take the product of the two scalars first, then multiply by the matrix, or I can multiply the matrix by the first scalar, take its output and then multiply by the second. Uh, this is known as associativity. But again, I'll, I'll come to that in two minutes. If I have two matrices and I'm multiplying them together and then multiplying by scalar, I can also just do the scalar multiplication at any arbitrary point here. Um, so on the right, in the middle, on the left, I can do the product of the matrices first and then do it. Whatever you want, the scalar multiplication doesn't make this difficult, but you will note that the B here is always on the left of the C. Again, you can't flip the order arbitrarily with that unless there's an identity telling you you can. All right. Transposed doesn't change the story. Uh, if I have two scalars that are being added together and then multiplied by C, then that's the same as multiplying C by the two scalars and then adding. Okay, so that's known as distribution. And then you can also distribute with matrices. So you take the lambda and you foil it into the brackets and then you add after that. All right, so matrix multiplication with a scalar is very intuitive. There's usually the kind of intuition that you want from, you know, like just normal algebra, usually just comes through fine. All right, now we're into the actual, I guess, first non-definition bits of today. So does anyone have any kind of questions before I carry on? Yeah. Um, we need to know how to improve the basic properties. Uh, base property as in these things? Yeah, I mean, these index notations, we need to know how to improve them. Um, for calculus, you do. Uh, what well, I mean, for calculus, it's more of like how you derive it. In general, no. The, the trick to this course with the proofs is that the proofs uh, come from the tutorials. So I know I said I don't ask from the tutorials. Proofs will come from your tutorials. Um, so you don't have to go and like learn arbitrary proofs of anything like that. Learn the proofs in your tutorials again, because those are the ones that I think have a lesson to them. Um, other than that, yeah, no, no real proofs. The matrices also have to be square. Okay, well, let's let's think about it. So if this is M by, let's say M by K, this is K by N, then this will be M by K, K by N. This is why I use the tablet. M by K, K by N. Transpose that, that's N by K, no. And that's why the, the order has to reverse here as well. Um, 
Yeah. Anyone with a pen and paper want to just check that that rotated property? But I'm, I'm yeah, 99% confident on that one. Anything else? Yeah. Cool. All right. So now we're going to go into particular and general solutions. This is now how we actually solve that issue uh, from earlier with like this production problem or whatever. And so on to kind of go back to your question now, this is where it matters how many X's we have and how many columns we have. And so before we describe a more mechanistic approach to solving these, let's just consider a little bit of the intuition of how we go about solving them. So in this setup, do you guys think there will be a unique solution? Okay, how come? Yeah, exactly, there we go. So we have more variables than we have limiting equations. So no, there is not gonna be, uh, there's not gonna be one unique solution to this, there's actually gonna be infinitely many in uh, space. All right, uh, and it's exactly what you guys said. And again, I just always wanna remind you that this is the notation. So again, it's like C1 is a recipe of the cake and X1 is how many of those cakes we're producing or whatever, okay? And so we can get at least one possible solution just by considering like the underlying problem. And this is kind of what the slides were alluding to earlier when it said that the answer is just in the A. All you really need to consider is the structure of that A matrix, which tells you the relationship between resources and products, okay? And so if we're only looking at X1 and X2, you can get what is known as a particular solution just by setting them to 42 and eight. So I substitute in 42 there and eight there, and I set all these uh, X3 and X4 to zero, I'm gonna get the answer to this equation. This is gonna balance out, right? Because that's 42 times one gives us 42, and then eight times one gives us eight. Everything else is zero. Um, and so that's known as the particular solution. It solves it, but it's not the, it doesn't tell us everything about the structure of the problem. And so there are two requirements for something to be known as a particular solution. It is number one, it has to solve the system, obviously. And then secondly, it needs to use the minimum number of coefficients. And so the coefficients here are X1, X2, X3, and X4. If there was another way of doing this that used all of them, then it wouldn't be a particular solution, okay? That's gonna come up now in the general solution. But uh, so it has to use X1 and X2 in this case, or X3 and X4 or so on. Okay, that's the, the second requirement. Um, but there are others. Okay, so this was the most intuitive because that was one zero and zero one. So it made it easy to just read it off. But there's also other particular solutions. So for example, you can use X2 is equal to that. And X3 is equal to five and one quarters. And everything else, X1 and X4 is equal to zero you'll still solve the system of equations, all right? So there are multiple particular solutions. And you can use either of them, but uh, in general, the first one's the easiest, okay? So that's particular solution. And again, I just wanna point out that only used two coefficients, right? So it used a minimum number of coefficients, so it is a particular solution. So now I wanna to get to the general solution. Uh, we need to find out ways to get zeros using the system of equation, all right? So we're now no longer trying to get 42 and eight on the side. We know we can set values for X1 and X2 so that that is true. What we now wanna do is look at, again, these like call them recipes or whatever for the production and figure out how do we produce things so that we actually use zero, uh, zero resources or whatever, okay? And so now what we're going to do is we're going to find X1, X2, X3, and X4 such that those give us zeros. Okay. And so this way, if we add the newly constructed solution to the found particular solution, we just get back to the original again, because you're essentially, again, adding zeros to your particular solution. So what the way you do this is now you're going to build the third column vector C3 from C1 and C2. Okay. So again, this was where we started. So now we're going to try and see how do I get eight and two out of one zero zero one okay pretty easy you know that that's just eight times two and then you subtract that third column from it so now you get a zero there okay is everyone still following this procedure i'm sure it's normal cool all right so this then corresponds to th this vector at the bottom here and again you this is it's actually a, a particularly weird point where sometimes if the first time you're doing it yourself it's a bit tricky um we haven't puts 
the, the CX4 into this, right? So we haven't constructed C4 or anything. So X4 is by implied to be zero. When you're setting up this problem, don't forget to put the zero because then you're going to get to a case where you have like a three-dimensional vector. It's going to look a little bit funny and it's gonna, you're going to get stuck. So the fact that we haven't actually used X4 in constructing C3 means it's zero. Okay. And on top of that, any scalar multiplied by this setup will also be zero, right? Because that's just going to be lambda one times by zero. Okay. So now I know that I can multiply anything here by a lambda and I'm still going to get zero. And so that is an entire space of solutions, right? It's lambda one times by that, this vector here is the first part of our general solution. Okay. We're going to then do the exact same thing for the, for C4. All right. So how do I construct C4 from C1, C2? Again, because those are easy, the, you can just read off the answer. Uh, and again, for any lambda two, and it's lambda two, it's a different scalar. Okay, so I can set it arbitrarily compared to lambda one on the previous side. Uh, I can still get a zero. And so now we've got our particular solution, which was this choice of 42 and eight over here. And now I'm gonna add to it all of these zeros that we just found, which is any lambda times by the set of x1, x2, x3, and x4 that gave us zero there, and the set that gave us zero there. And it's true for any lambda one and lambda two. So there's a two dimensional space defined by these things of kind of arbitrary solutions to this. Is everyone kind of happy with how this is going so far? The, the, especially the thought process behind this, you're not gonna solve these things like this, but it's, an, it's helpful if you know now why these vectors are merging like they are. Is everyone comfortable? Cool. Yeah. Um, the general solution, give an example of like how it would be used in any context of your metric or otherwise. Yeah, so I mean that's similar to what I was saying maybe earlier. And okay, it's hard to come up with these examples on the spot. But uh so again, let's say that column vector one there was uh Chelix. And column vector two was tabletops, and three is metal, and four is wood, or something like that. You again, you can either buy chair legs directly, or you can buy metal and manufacture it. And that's that's the idea of can I build C three out of C one there? Can I get chair legs from metal? Can I get or you know melt down the chair leg to get new metal, whatever? Can, is there a relationship between the two recipes that I can get one out of the other? That's kind of in this manufacturing example, at least, uh, the idea there. Is that helpful? I can try again. We good? Cool. All right. Yes. Oh, did you not raise your hand? All right. Uh, everyone happy? I know this. Yeah, I know this is boring and slow. And I'm gonna kind of stop apologizing for it now, but it will get a little bit better, I promise. Okay. We're all happy though. We good? Cool. Okay. So. We've now got our general solution here. And by the way, when we formulate this in a test, please write it that way. Like just take note of the format. It just makes it easier for my markers. Uh, I know that's a, a thing I'm putting on you, but it just, it really does help. You can kind of leave off this X thing at the front. I don't really care about that. But writing it as particular solution plus dimension one of your general plus dimension two of your general plus all the other dimensions of your general. And then remember to say that. Um, we're not pedantic. We don't drop marks for it, but it, it kind of just helps the markers if it looks the same. Um, so do that, please. But the way to actually go about this and to like kind of systematize it is to start off with this matrix like this. We find a particular solution to it. Then once we know that we can get B out of the matrix, we then find all the possible ways that the system can give us zero. Okay. And then from that, we combine the two solutions and we can uh, create the general solution. Okay, so then it literally just becomes pretty much B plus zero. All right. Uh, for homework, if you want, you can repeat it with that other ugly particular solution, but uh, you know, do, do as you will. Um, what's important to note is that if you start with a, partic a different particular solution, your general solution is going to look different. Okay, but it will be equivalent. They're just written in terms of different bases, which is something I'll explain next week. That is written in terms of different bases, but they are actually representing the same fundamental space of I can melt chair legs to get metal or so on. Okay. Um, I don't have my tablet on me. 
yeah, because of the internet. But there's a, also an interesting way to check your solution here. If you if you take this solution, okay, and just arbitrarily, because we can choose lambda one, lambda two as elements of the reals, set it equal to one, just make your life easy. If you take this x, okay, and you substitute it into, yeah, let's say, okay, so this will be a capital A for whatever we give you, that's your x. And you substitute in there and you do your matrix multiplication, you have to get back out to that. If you don't, then obviously you've done something wrong. That was the definition of what we were solving. But this is really useful because what it will show you is in particular when you've got your general solutions wrong. It'll kind of give you an indication as you like do the working out which general solution went wrong and, and for what reason. But it's also kind of indicates that what we've done up top here is gone. A, we found AX that gives us B. We found the AX that gives us zero and we've added them together. So that's essentially A times X1 plus a times x2, you can factor out that a, and what you've then got is a times x1 plus x2. And that's what this is. This is the x1, and this is your set of x2s. Okay? And so you've kind of, if you are trying to follow the intuition of these steps of I find how to get b, and I find how to get zeros, that's by substituting your x back in, it'll also make it pretty clear that what part of each of those steps this format corresponds to. In my opinion, if that doesn't work for you, you don't have to do it that way, but uh, it's always a nice check. Anyway, um, especially when we get to the matrix multiplication version of it and it doesn't like look like the same format exactly. Um, but so the matrix multiplication way of doing it is just more uh, convenient, uh, particularly because we can define something called the augmented matrix. So if this is the setup we want to solve, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take A as a matrix, as you usually would, and I'm just going to take B and put it as one more column next to it, okay? So this is A times X times B, and the augmented matrix just takes that row, column vector there and adds it into the matrix. And you put a line there just for, because it helps you keep track. Um, in this form, it now becomes easy to do what are called elementary row tran elementary transformations to change the matrix from row echelon form, uh, change it into row echelon form or reduced row echelon form. And this is also why this initial example was easy is because we gave it to you in reduced row echelon form. All right, so I'm gonna go through the definition now. But the way that you kind of read off your solution from these things is it comes from the niceness of the format of reduced row echelon form. It's not that there's anything kind of mathematically actually changing, okay. So by elementary transformations, what we mean, there are three of them. You can exchange two equations. So two rows in the matrices um, representing the system of equations. So for example, I can take that row and make it second and that make that row first, doesn't matter. And the whole point of this is that none of these three operations is changing the constraints on our system. Whether I said that, whether I deal with call it um, product one or product two first, doesn't matter. As long as product one has its correct recipe, product two has its correct recipe, and I'm kind of changing things correspondingly, I'm not restricting, I'm not changing the restrictions on the system. I'm just writing them in a different format. Okay. So for example, here, you know that one times x1 plus two times x2 must be equal to five, regardless of whether or not I write it here or here, that's going to be, that's still true when I do the matrix multiplication like this, right? So that's there. Then multiplication of an, of an equation with a non-zero real valued scalar. So again, if I have one times X1, two times X2 must be equal to five, then any multiplication of that's also gonna be, need to be equal. So two times X1 plus four times X2 will equal to 10. That still gives you the same X1, X2 at the end of the day, right? The, the restrictions of the system between, you know, the columns and rows and all of that is still the same. Okay, and then lastly, Addition of two equations or two rows also matters, uh, or also can um, you can just add them together. And again, you have two equations limiting the system. If I kind of add them together or anything like that, I'm not adding information or changing information or changing restrictions. I'm just writing it in a different format. Anything else would be changing the restrictions on the systems, right? So swapping columns, for, an ex for example, because the columns are the recipes, 
And those, when we do matrix multiplication, it's column one times by X1, column two times by X2. If I swap these columns, what I'm doing is changing the recipes of X1 and X2, okay? And then that changes the restrictions on the system. So, but rows, because rows is just consistently like uh, multiplying, so one will be times by X1 here and three by X1 here, I can swap these two rows, all right? But they'll still always be multiplying by X1 in the same way. Okay, so to define row echelon form, and it's a fairly arbitrary uh, definition, but hopefully the intuition of how it looks will come through. So matrix is in row echelon form. If all rows that contain only zeros are at the bottom of the matrix, okay? So it needs to be down there, although that has a four in it. Uh, but if there was a, a row that was zero, 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 then that would kind of fit the, the definition. You can't have a row that is zero, 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 Okay, Ziando, we're back. Okay, my apologies, thank you. All right. Okay, so uh, we can now transform our system into the augmented matrix, our system in the augmented matrix into reduced racial on form using the elementary transformations. Uh, so, for example, if A was invertible and we applied the elementary row transformations to B as we did the transformations uh, in the same way we did to A, then the resulting right-hand side of the augmented matrix is, in fact, our solution. I'll show you this now. That's a bit of a wordy sentence. Um, if A was not invert invertible, what will happen is we will either arrive at a contradiction. So this is as an example of a contradiction here where we have 0, 0 must be equal to 1. That's obviously never going to be true. All right, and so that means there's no solution to the problem, or we're in a good position now to find the particular and the general solutions. All right. And again, that's because it was non-invertible um, means that there might be infinitely many solutions. Okay, and so we will consider an example of both cases. It is worth mentioning that generally on a PC, the transformation is done using an algorithm called Gaussian elimination, or rather a more numerically stable version of it. Um, so to consider this an example, let's say we have our A matrix here and our B matrix over here. Firstly, we can swap row one and row two. Again, you're not adding or changing information in the system. You're just altering the order of the equations. You can then say that row two is uh, add negative two times row one to the second row and three times row one to the third row and so on. And the whole point and the logic behind doing this step here is because we want to get rid of that two. Okay, we want to put a zero there below the one because this is going to be the pivot of the first row and we want to get in reduced row echelon form so we know it has to have zeros underneath it. So that's the first thing to do is essentially just try get zeros here and then we'll work out the rest afterwards. So if I want to get zero there, I want to get minus two times row one. So that's two minus two 
zero. Here I want to add three times row one, so I add three ones, becomes zero, and so on. But again, you have to then do it to all the other elements of the row as well, so that you're not changing the information in the system, you're not changing the recipes, so call it. Yeah. Oh no. All right, and then um, we're going to keep doing that. Now, what the next thing we want to do is we want to make sure that the we get a pivot in the next row. So, for example, this five. Uh, it needs to be a one to be in reduced row echelon form. So we're going to divide this row by five. Okay. You know, I have a pivot and you can use that to get zeros everywhere else and so on. And this is actually Gauss elimination um, is when you do this in this like column order where you get a pivot, you get zeros, you get the next pivot, you get zeros, you get the next pivot, you get zeros. Uh, please don't do this just as a, a, a technique or like a tip to solving these. For example, here it's ambiguous which order you're doing these operations in. Do, am I dividing by R2 first here and then using R2 to operate on the third row or, or whatever? Could do it alternately. And then if you do try to do that, you could, you know, if you do that in the wrong order and now you do make mistakes, just do work on one row at a time if you have to. Or like here, if you use row one to, on two and three simultaneously, that's fine. But don't use row two on itself and then or like don't change row two and then try use it to operate on row three or row one, for example. Uh, and then have to say like what step one is and what step two is. Uh, you can do it if you want and it's possible, but it's just messy. All right. And so ultimately what we're eventually gonna do is we're gonna get down to all of our pivot columns here, zeros everywhere else, and then we can read off the solution. Okay, and that's now our, ultimately our B. And what this corresponds to is we start off with our augmented matrix, so A, B, and we multiply it on the left by the inverse of A, and then what we get is A inverse B, okay? You need to set up this problem and do it this way, or else what you're ultimately, there is a way that you can ultimately do A, B, A inverse, or like you do the effect of right multiplying, which is then wrong, because now A and A inverse are not next to each other, they're not going to cancel. So that is the one way where formatting of these things will affect you. So please make sure that you set it like the augmented matrix up in this way. Um, but this, again, I, when we go through tutorials, I'll go more into that point because it'll be, it no doubt will come up. Um, in this case, the particular and general solutions are the same. And the reason for that is that we had no row of zeros here. Okay, so we had three equations, Three, constra three constraints, and so there's a unique solution that we just read off, and in this case is that x1 must be equal to three, x2 is equal to two, and x3 is equal to one. All right, there's our solution there. Does everyone follow the um, logic of this? You understand that this is ultimately what we're doing when we do these row operations, is that it's just like an algorithm to apply systematically like an inverse operation. Cool, no questions? Great. Uh, no questions online? Cool. All right, if we consider a second case, which is to use this system of equations here and we get into ro reduced row echelon form. So our pivots are all one, no zeros in any column that has a pivot. And then we end up with this one kind of arbitrary column here and a row of all zeros, we now have infinitely many solutions, right? All right, so since we have the left side is not the identity and we have not encountered a contradiction, we have infinitely many solutions. A contradiction here would be again, if that was like two. So we have zero plus zero plus zero is equal to two, never gonna happen with any coefficients of x1, x2, x3. So it's a contradiction. In this case, we got all zeros and so we're fine. But what it means now is that we have three columns. So we have x1, x2, x3, so three variables to set. But only in reality, we only have two equations here to restrict ourselves, which means we're going to have one free variable. So there's one dimension, the third dimension, that's free. Okay, and so obtaining the particular um, and general solution can be done as before, but the reduced row echelon form makes it easy. Again, what you're going to do is you're going to read off a particular solution using those values. And then after that, you're just going to construct uh, column three from column one and two. 
There is, I'm gonna show you in two minutes another way to do the general solution even easier, but uh, we're gonna just build that up slowly. Okay, so uh, to obtain a particular solution, we express the right-hand side of the equation using the pivot columns only. Again, so we're gonna set X3 to zero, all right, and just use X1 and X2 here, okay? So these are the pivot columns. This gets a little bit heavy on the notation, which is unnecessary. Um, and so for the current system, we want to get a minus two over here. So we're going to set lambda one or x one, they've changed notation, to minus two, so that we get one times minus two is equal to minus two. Then for the lambda two, we're going to set it to be a quarter, so that we get one times a quarter is equal to a quarter. That's our particular solution. And again, it's particular because it number one solves the system, but also because it used the minimum number of lambdas or x's or whatever vector we're multiplying by. All right. And so it needed that zero to be a particular solution. To get the general solution, we're now going to use what's called the minus one trick. Um, and so this is essentially doing what we did before, where we construct uh, this column from the earlier columns. But because we know it's in reduced row echelon form, it's just easy to kind of make a like the, the format makes it easy to make a rule. There's nothing actually mathematically fundamental going on here. It is purely just due to the format that we've made. Okay. So uh, let A be a matrix such that K is less than N. So it has less rows than columns, which means we have more X's to multiply by than, than equations. And it's in reduced, uh, it's in row echelon form, but I would say put in reduced row echelon form. Assume there are no rows with only zero elements. Um, and then we, we extend this matrix to be an n by n matrix A hat by adding enough minus ones of this format here, All right? So that the diagonal of the augmented matrix contains only ones or minus ones. Then the columns of A that contain the minus ones as pivots are your solutions to this equation. Again, wordy, this is more maybe when you study, you can go through this, but the way this works, the way this works is we've ended up at this solution here. All right, we have that row of all zeros and the solution is zero. I think on the previous side where it says, assume you have no rows of all zeros, that's saying, don't assume you don't have a contradiction. Um, what's gonna happen now is we're gonna then drop that row. Okay, we're gonna have nothing left there and we're gonna augment it with the minus one in where a pivot should go. Okay, so the pivot should then be to the right of the previous rows pivot. So we only need one to make this n by n to make it a square matrix. And so we just add this one minus one on the bottom right here. Then that column, you just read it off and that's the general solution. Okay, so that is literally the entire trick is drop the any row of zeros, put a minus one there, put as many minus ones as you need to get to an n by n matrix. So for example, if we had a, another like minus four and a two over here, you would then need to get to a four by four matrix so we would have done this twice. It would then be zero, zero, minus one, zero, 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 minus one. Now you have a four by four matrix. And then you just read off your solution. And the reason this works is purely because we know that this is a one over here and a one over here. So when you do that matrix multiplication, when you're multiplying by X1, X2, X3 over here, you know that what you're gonna end up getting um, how can I show this without the, the board? What you're going to end up getting is this term times by x1, this term times by x3, but we've constructed the x3 in a way that it's going to cancel out perfectly. All right, and it just came from the format itself. Uh, I would recommend you try this just to prove your, for, your, uh, for yourself. Same way I did earlier, I said you should do earlier last time. Take the original A matrix and multiply on the left, multiply x on the left by A and do that foiling. And what you will then see when you do the matrix multiplication is that this minus one will always correspond to whatever the minus five is multiplying by, and they will end up canceling. All right. Um, and that's it. So that's the entire process. Okay. Take your matrix, stack it into whatever format you need, get reduced row echelon form, read off your particular solutions using your pivots, and then add as many rows and minus ones that you need and then read off those columns as your general solutions. This only works in reduced row echelon form, by the way. So you need to have the this kind of full pivots out front here. Cool. 
in order to find the inverse of a matrix, we can do a similar thing. So as I said here, um, where are we up here? What we're essentially doing when we do rho echelon form in this in this way is we're essentially multiplying on the left by a inverse. So what we could also do is just set up a problem such that, and then it's the same as then multiplying B by A inverse as well when we kind of foil that matrix multiplication in. So what we could also do is set up a problem where we have A on the left and then the identity matrix on the right. So that when we do the matrix multiplication, what we get is the identity matrix on the left and then A inverse times the identity on the right, which will then just tell us the inverse, inverse uh, invertible matrix, the inverse matrix, all right? So setting B to be the identity is just a good way to for us to then figure out what the inverse is. Okay. And so, and so we can set this up at, uh, like this. So the inverse A in inverse is the matrix X that produces the identity when you multiply uh, on the left or the right. Remember there's an identity for this. So there's fundamentally a set of systems of linear equations again. This is just a system of linear equations again. And we're going to just solve it again by going A inverse on the left, canceling out, and then that's actually what you get afterwards. Uh, this is usually less efficient than solving a system of equations like we did before with just a column vector of Bs, because now obviously the identity matrix is an N by N matrix. It's not just a column vector, so that's going to be a bit slower. Um, and so this isn't something we like we love to do or you kind of would rush to do, but it follows the same exact process. And if you are in kind of desperate need of an inverse, kind of in doing it by hand, it's a very reliable way of getting there. All right. And then last slide before we take a break, a uh, quick break. Um, then we have the approximate solution now. So we've looked at cases where you get a contradiction, so the system can't be solved. We've looked at cases where you get reduced ray echelon form gives you the identity matrix. So you have as many variables as you have restrictions. And so uh, you can then just read off the solution. And there's one particular solution. We've looked at getting a particular and a general solution. All right. So in that case, that's where you get a row of zeros in your augmented mate or in your row echelon form matrix. All right. And you have more variables, more X's than the number of equations restricting them. Uh, and that should, gives you a particular and a general solution. So now we have a fourth, which is, well, it's kind of builds out from the first, whereas we don't have a solution. What do we do? How do we get as close as possible? All right. And those are the three we care about. It's, as, it's unsolvable, but getting close. It's solvable with a unique particular solution. And then it's solvable with a space of general solutions. And then there's like infinitely many because you can just multiply by the lambdas. All right. So what do we do in this case? Under mild assumptions on A, and I'll tell you what those assumptions are now, but the, so the, I'll tell you why we need the assumption now. So it's linearly independent. We want to find X that's as close to solving the system as possible. All right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use the following transformation. So this is a system of equations that we want to solve. We're going to multiply both sides on the left by A transposed. Okay. And then lastly, we're then going to multiply all of that by A transposed inverse, which gives us our solution. Okay, so we're going to then invert A transposed A there so that we just end up with X on the left hand side. And then we have this inverse on the right hand side. Okay, it looks pretty arbitrary. I know that it's a it's kind of a weird few steps, but the whole thought process that we're trying to get here is we want to try and get a matrix that is invertible, okay? So the fact that there was no system of equations that worked for this means that A is not invertible. So the next best thing to do is just get something that can be inverted. And it turns out that if A has linearly independent columns, which I'll explain linear independence in kind of the coming weeks, but if it turns out if A is linearly independent, then A transposed times by A will be full rank, it will be invertible, it will be non-singular. Okay, what that means is that now that we've constructed something on the left hand side that is invertible, it means we can take its inverse, get the identity there and get X alone, which is all we wanted in the, to begin with anyway. And so we get X on the left hand side, the inverse from this matrix that is now 
invertible by assumption because of the linear independence times by what we just kind of started with, all right? Or what we started with and then the A transpose we multiplied by. This has a very specific name. Um, this is known as the Moore Penrose pseudo inverse. Okay, so made by Moore and Penrose. Uh, and so it's another way of inverting A. Okay, you can think of it as another A inverse matrix. So in the same kind of idea where what I really wanted to do was multiply on the left by A inverse to drop that and then you just get A inverse times B on the right, which is the answer to X. You're going to instead use the pseudo inverse on the left of both sides. And that's it. it it's the same idea after that. Okay, and I've kind of shown a little you know, a little bit more of the derivation down here, but it's exactly the same thing there. But just to be clear, the whole point is that we get A transposed times by A transposed inverse, which gives us the identity matrix. All right. And it turns out you can prove this and we'll actually show this in week four that this is the best solution we can get. All right, so that actually minimizes the, how wrong you are or how far away you are from getting to B. All right, um, does anyone have any, it's four o'clock, uh, does anyone have any questions before we take a break? Are we all happy so far? Cool, all right, I'll see you guys in 15 minutes and we can uh, wrap up. This thing. Yeah, that, that's the ultimate. It's the thing that minimizes that norm. So that norm tells us how wrong we are. It's how far away A times X is from B. Right? Because what we want to get is A X equal to B. So you know zero has it. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's literally the error. Hey, how are you? Good, good. I don't know if you mentioned before, but are you using the slides before the lecture? Or... Yeah, before they're on Moodle now. And it's going to run. Yeah. Are you good for? I try to put it up at least by the morning on. Uh, it's kind of on me to do it. But why, when, when do you need it? From thinking about um, contemplating. Uh, like, so it'll help me if I did it on like Thursday evening or like Thursday afternoon. Okay, I'll try my best. Feel free to ping me on Discord if I forget. It. Another answer to this. So we cover no labs. Yeah, no labs. Just just lectures and uh, the tutorials as well. I just released. Them. So the only thing we have is two 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 five on the Friday. Yeah. Yes. And we reduce down to two. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> what's the significance of that? Like, yeah. Like, I don't know why. That's why have we moved forward and reduced two dimensions specifically? So, I mean, we're going to come to this as a, a, like a big equivalence in analytical geometry of how many dimensions are left off you've constrained by the first state and off you've done this kind of projection and stuff so it is significant so the number of uh you so you have x1 x2 x3 x4 yeah so you're in a 
in a poorly hyperspace. They're trying to find the one solution in that that solves the system of equations. Okay. If there's not one, if you've only restricted along two dimensions, you've only kind of compressed your solution space along okay. two directions. What you're left with is the solution space of all the others. So now, why do we compress? Why don't we find the solution space in 4D? Why, why do we go into 2D? Why would we say something like that? Oh, because that's what the functions are, are doing. That's the... Um, that's literally what each of those equations is doing, is restricting the, the solution space. Right, so it's telling you that... Why, why do we want that? That seems strange. Uh, where's a good example? Where's that? This thing. Um, how, do, how do I explain this? So, um, Like I see you removing three and four then, we've moved to two D, but like so so no, but in, in general what we do want is to collapse space. Right. So that, that's the kind of the whole thing is in in I'm trying to think of a, an intuitive way to explain this. Um, Okay, so let's put this way. Each each of these four vectors is a representation of space. <laughs> okay. So what's happened now is um, should I take out my book? You can. I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to draw it. Because like I'm just like I'm just thinking of the question why not one in space? No, no, no. I mean, I, it's a it's a good question, and it's it's one that I do kind of answer next week. I'll I'll do an example okay. of this where I try and tie a lot of the ideas together. So, but I, I it's um I, the way I get around that is by relying on the, the matrix interpretation of it, not the equations interpretation of it. So a lot of the times in mathematics, that's kind of the, what we do is if something's difficult to interpret one way. You just have a different trick to try and interpret it. Same way that a lot of the times when we think about neural networks, we we kind of think about their loss landscape in a lot simpler terms than what they actually are. But you can still make progress. So is it is taking it down to two D space, one D space, um, just for our sake? Like a computer, maybe wouldn't have to do that. Like it'd be fine. Like I can handle all of this data. Well, for us, it's like the interpretation of this is that it was always 2D space, it was never 4D space. We think of we see x1, x2, x3, x4, and our mind says, Wow, 4D space that's we could move in there, but the mathematics says, No, we can move in 2D, and that's because of how the system is structured. What we're doing here is re representing the system. So it becomes apparent to us that what it really is is 2D space. Okay, so it's like a fraction that's like, you know, like 6 over 3, which is rarely just basically... Yes, two exactly. Oh, okay. Okay, that makes sense. And that 6 over 3, what you've just described there, is actually change your basis. Yeah. Your basis there would be 3, your reference is 6. Yeah. And that's equal to doing 2 over 1. You've changed your unit of measurement, be it 3 or 1, you got something else, two or six. So that's the interpretation here is that all we're really redoing with these row operations is re representing the system of equations in a way where we can interpret it. And then we just read it off, right? Yeah. yeah. So we actually haven't solved anything. It gives the impression that we're changing things, but we're not. At the end of the day, what we're changing from is ideas of units of resources to units of product. And that'll become a little bit clearer next week when I do that example. But all it is is a change of representation. So, so for six of the three, right? I know how to see that that is like three times. I'm like, I put my way here. I'm yeah. Sorry, <laughs> more questions. No, no, that's good. Yeah. How do we know that this is going from four D is actually to like how we know it's. Oh, that any dimension whatsoever. That we can see just by the fact that now we have. Um, we'll get rows of zeros. And then when we get rows of zeros, what does that uh, indicate to us is that a lot of the dimensions were zeros. Is that only after sending x3 and x4 to zero? No, no, so like if we're solving this system of equations here, okay. um, where was it? 
Not uh, that one. This, not that one. This one. Yeah. Well, this this tells us that our perspective of four dimensions was actually something else. Okay. And this is before having restricted ourselves to two dimensions. Well, again, we've always been restricted to two dimensions. We just couldn't see it. Okay. Oh, this is before setting x3 and x4 to zero. Yeah. Okay. So that again, that's setting x3 and x4 to, to zero. That's just how we read off the solution. It's yeah. not the 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 system itself was never um you know in setting in 4D. Yeah. Those x's were always constrained to 2D. Uh, I, but before I do that, I want to know that it's 2D. Yes. Before setting, and I was just yeah, exactly. How do I know that it's like, exactly how do I change my perspective to know that it's actually 2D? Yes. 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 That's all we're doing here. Okay. Yeah. 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 That was the uh, minus one. Yeah. That's only when it gets all zeros. Uh, yeah, all zeros at the bottom. How do you do your words? Yes. Reduce yeah. fresh one. Uh, if you get like a contradiction, then you can't do it. Okay, then you put the minus one. Yes. Then you put just the, the minus one in each of the diagonals. Thank you. Yeah. What you were asking about now will also become more clearer during the course. So um, you're preempting a bit of things, but hopefully that's those loops close soon. Yeah. 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 So we're going to try to get away from that now. Um, some of them are hard. That, like, for example, that wasn't, you know, it's not easy to chew at that. But uh, yeah, it's hopefully that's what comes out. And that's what you need to be a good data scientist, in my opinion. So, um, like, you can follow steps, but someone's going to ask you to interpret something and be like, oh, well, I don't understand what a basis is. I can't tell you this. Um, by the way, that what where I'm saying a change of perspective, what's that not that's known as is a change of basis. All right, everyone, do you want to start uh, heading back in, getting settled? Cool. All right. So for the last little bit now, and I, I don't actually think we have too many slides left, like maybe eight. Oh yeah, like five. All right, we're just going to talk about groups. Uh, this is an abstract concept in mathematics. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about group theory. Uh, very, very powerful in its own right, if you go more advanced levels of it. But what this is also going to start getting getting at is that one of the reasons why we de define mathematical concepts 
is that we can just reuse all of the results we know about them. We can just, you know, reuse everything. Once something is shown to be a group, it has a whole bunch of properties we can take for granted. Um, and vectors are an example of a group. It's a more advanced kind of, you know, closed, smaller set than a group. Um, in your first test, you will be asked to show that something is a group in your tutorials. There's questions on this. Uh, you do need to know the four properties of by heart and know, like, remember them. Uh, this is the only, uh, this is the only definition kind of thing I ask. Um, but I do want you to know these four properties. And so we're going to go through them now. Uh, and it's, it's defined as abstract as possible. So I, I appreciate that at this point, there's very little geometric intuition or anything going to come out of it for now. Um, so let G be a set. So a set is just a, you know, a, an array, call it if one use programming language, an array of values. And then this symbol here is an operator. This symbol takes in two values from your set. Okay, that's what this notation means. So it's, when you see a, a cross like this, that's the cross product. So what it means is any two values from G, from G, all right? And it will give you another value that is in G, okay? So we have this big group of like, you know, sets of values. I'm going to take any two of them. I'm going to do this cross operator on it. And I will get back to another value that is in that set by definition. If that is not true, then it's not a group. So if I tell you something's a group, that is true by definition. Okay. And it is also true that if it's a group, the following properties hold. So the first is called closure of the set G under the operator. So what that means is essentially what I just described. For all X and Y, which are in our set G, so for any two elements, so for uh, as far as notation is concerned, this is the same as writing like that and like that. This is your group way of writing it. This is your kind of elements of the group way of writing it. So for any two elements of G, I take both of them and I apply the operator. I will get out another element of G that is known as closure. So I cannot leave the group by applying the operator. It's closed. Okay. Then for any three elements of the group, I can first apply the operator to X and Y, get the solution, and then apply Z with the same operator. Or I can apply the operator to Y and Z and then get the output and apply it to X, and then I will get the same answer. So the order of whether I go Y, X, then Z, or Y, Z, then X, doesn't matter. That's called associativity, okay? We said earlier that matrix multiplication is associative. Is, yeah, if I have three matrices A, B, C, I can go A and B times by C, or I can go A times by brackets B, C. Uh, you can't swap them around, like you can't go change the ordering, but you can change kind of which where you go right to left or left to right. Uh, then there is the neutral element, so this notation means there exists an element E. We're just giving it a, a random uh, symbol here. So there exists an element E of our set such that for any other elements of our set, applying this operator to that value X will give you X. So in other words, there is an element of the set which does nothing with this operator. Okay, and you can go E on the left or the right. That doesn't matter. Okay. The similar thing to the neutral element is the inverse element. So for all X, there exists a Y such that when I do this operator on X and Y, I get the neutral element. Okay. So again, pretty um, unintuitive. But for example, we know that there is a neutral element in real values with addition. It's when I add zero. Okay. So if I go, so there exists a value in our set. The set there is the real numbers. The element is zero. If I add that to X, I get X. All right. If, and then similarly for all X, so for any number in the real line, there is another value in the real line such that if I then add them together, I get my neutral element. So if that's four, the other value is minus four. And so I get zero. When you're doing these proofs, remember that this E has to be the same. And this Y can change. Okay. 
So what you're going to do is when, when you do these proofs, you're going to take an X from your set and you're going to try and find a fixed value for E, which returns X. All right. When you're trying to show the inverse, what you're going to do is you're going to take a value of X and you're going to try and find any other value such that you get back to your neutral element. All right. So it's a little bit unintuitive and it takes a little bit of practice. I don't expect me just saying that to really kind of set in. But just remember that this is a more flexible, uh, when you're solving it, kind of any of these Ys will work for you. You don't have to find a fixed Y for all of them. And so if you have a group, all four of these elements hold. All right. And this Y, this inverse is often denoted with the minus one up top, uh, particularly on the real line, or for example, when we did matrix inverse earlier. All right. Um, there is one more extension to it that is known as an abelian group. So exact same thing, if G is a group, then it is an abelian group if it also has commutativity. So if I can take X and Y in G and the order that I apply these, this operation doesn't matter, then it's abelian, okay? And we'll see examples and there's examples in the types of this. All right. So a couple of examples here. The set of integers, with the operator of addition, so integer addition, is an abelian group, so we can look at it. Is it closed? Yeah, if I take any elements of my integers and I add it with another element of my integers, I get back an integer. So four plus minus three, whatever, gives me one. That's an integer. That's going to be true for all of them. Uh, associativity, if I go three plus four plus five and I group the three and the four first, so it's then seven plus five, I'll get to the same answer as if I did the four and the five, I got nine, and then I added um, what three. So whatever order I do the addition in, uh, it doesn't matter. That's associativity. Neutral elements, we know that it is zero. All right, so if I add zero to any of the integers, then uh, I'm going to just get back the normal integer. And then for every element of the integers, so for example, four or five or six, I know there exists another integer that will give me the neutral element zero namely negative four, negative five, negative six. And then lastly, it's abelian. I can go four plus five or five plus four. I'll get to the same answer. All right. Does anyone want to tell me why the natural numbers plus zero is not a group? I'll scroll up. So natural numbers is one through infinity, the integers and zero. Doesn't have an inverse element. Okay. You want to elaborate? So that's correct. You want to elaborate a little bit? Why? Why not? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yep, that's correct. So there's no, and so if you wanted to show that, you would actually just say let x be an element of the integers and then say y be the inverse and you show a contradiction. So in the ones we actually do, these are a little bit by definition. Uh, so it's not, not really easy to show these, but uh, kind of that's essentially what you just said is the proof technique when you want to show these things. Yes. Uh, that's why we did the union with zero. So it's natural number of union zero, but you're right. If that wasn't there, if we we're just doing the natural numbers from one to infinity, then it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have a neutral element either. And then obviously if it doesn't have a neutral element, it doesn't have an inverse element. All right. So it's a good point. Uh, in this case, because we had the union with zero that gave us a neutral element by this definition, but it didn't help us with an inverse. Okay. And then lastly, the matrix multiplication that we, or just matrices in general with matrix multiplication as the operator, which we discussed earlier, uh, that's not a group. And we discussed because uh, number one, it's not, you can't assume that it has an inverse, right? So it may not, not all n by n matrices are invertible. But on a more number theory level, there is a 
set of invertible called regular matrices, uh, which is known as the general linear group. And again, in more advanced levels of mathematics, people really, really care about this thing. It comes up a lot. Uh, it's not an, an abelian group, and that is because matrix multiplication is not commutative. So even though in that case, it's by definition got an inverse and, and a neutral element, it didn't assume it had a commutativity. And so uh, in that case, uh, it's still not an abelian group. All right, I think last two slides for today. Vector spaces. Now, vector spaces is defined using the idea of a group. Uh, so a real valued vector space is defined as the following with a set V. So same as in a group, we had a set, but now we have two operators on them. We have an inner operator and an outer operator, okay? The set V using the inner operator needs to be an abelian group, okay? And it needs to be closed with respect to scalar multiplication. So if I take any element of V with addition, okay, so this kind of um, vector vector addition, then I need to be able to get all of these five properties out, okay? Usually if I ever ask you to show that something's a vector space, I will tell you it's a group. And so you don't have to show this. You can assume that's true, but uh, you would need to know that obviously that like that's part of saying it's a group, show it's a vector space. You would know then you can assume those five properties. Um, and then closure with respect to scalar product is another one. So this is then the outer operation. So what this does is it takes a scalar value and any elements of my set and returns me an element of my set. So it's different to the inner operation. The inner operation just took piece uh, two elements from within my set to get me back to my set. Now you have an element that's outside of my set, this real value, which gets me back to my set. So that's where the words inner and outer come from. And then you need distributivity with respect to the, well, both operators. But so if I have a real value lambda, two uh, elements of my set, then I can distribute the lambda to the X and the Y first and add it together. And then if I have two scalars and a single vector and I'm adding together the two scalars first, I can do the distribution that way as well. Okay, so it's got distributivity. We need associativity of the outer operation. Okay, so we, by definition, we have associativity with respect to the inner operation because I've told you it's an abelian group, but we still now need to know, does it have associativity with the next operator? It does. So whether I go lambda gamma X or lambda times gamma times X, then uh, the answer doesn't change. And then lastly, we need to have a neutral element with respect to the outer operator. It is pretty much always using one as your real number. All right, and then you take the dot product with your set elements of your set and or you, it's, yeah, just normal multiplication with the elements of your set and you get back to that, that element. Okay, so those are what? Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, tenth property. So this uh, closure with respect to scalar operation is essentially saying this. All right, when I use scale operation, I need to get an element of my setup. So 10 properties of a vector space, it's a lot. And so vector spaces are actually not particularly uh, general things, they are very restrictive, but they're extremely powerful. Obviously that's gonna be the next five weeks of this course is linear algebra. Um, but what is cool is that, and maybe this is the, the last point of this of today, is that once we've defined these properties, anything that fits these properties, we can manipulate as if it's a vector and we can interpret geometrically, okay? So if our set is the n-dimensional real numbers with vector addition and multiplication by a scalar as the inner and the outer operator respectively, um, then those, that is the most commonly encountered vector space. And so we can see, for example, um, here, what also works in a similar way is if I'm using matrices, defining my set as a matrix, okay? So somewhat unintuitively, the space of M by N matrices is also a vector space with uh, element wise summation and scalar multiplication. Again, not matrix multiplication. We covered that up here. All right. Matrix multiplication, when that is the operator, it's not a group. When we're using su summation as our inner product and then scalar multiplication as our outer product, it is a group, it is a group and it is a vector space.
All right, and then lastly, as I showed you a little bit earlier with the, uh, with the polynomials, you can also start to think of in terms of function space as being a vector space if your functions have a set format so with different coefficients. And that comes up in a lot more in like functional, functional analysis and those sorts of uh, topics in mathematics. Let's see, did I leave a note here? Okay, that's what I said. All right, very abstract way to end it. Um, does anyone have any questions about groups and vector spaces? Yeah. It's any real number, but then when you want to define the uh, neutral element for that operator, then you're pick, picking one value of R. Everyone else happy? Yep. A value in group, by, by definition. Yes. Yes, but that's what we. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. The this is not so M and N are fixed values here. Uh, so, for example, there's the set of matrices that are one by two. There's the set of matrices that are two by three, so on. Um, but that's still the, a set that's fixed here. That's, yeah, good question. All right. Cool. Thanks, everyone. I will see you again next week. Um, and the recording will hopefully go up this afternoon, this evening. All right, thank you, Ziander.